good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, i am mildly surprised and also gratified to find that this last eighth session of a two day conference uh, has got respectable attendance uh, people are trickling in uh, it speaks actually of two things the galaxy of talent that we've been able to get at the idsa for this conference experts on various fields as also the interest which the audience has shown in coming all the way and spending two days out here extremely gratifying and uh, as uh, the presentations show uh, the quality of the presentation show uh, i think the work speaks for itself uh, we now commence the last session uh, and the subject given for this last session is also rather difficult because it talks about security and stability in wana and the way forward that is the title given and considering uh, all the prophecies mostly negative uh, over the last two days uh, it is going to take some time for us to uh, uh, it going to take some driving uh, there is no silver bullet to getting uh, decisions which are acceptable by all but what is most gratifying to see is that over the course of today from the beginning there has been talk across the board from all sections about dialogue secondly what is most gratifying is that whatever discussion we've had have been extremely mature without rancor and speak of the quality of our participants and for that i think everyone is to be commended our honorable minister of state for external affairs mr akbar when he spoke yesterday he started by saying that the uh, that the region of west asia is one place where the fault lines of world war 1 have not yet disappeared he couldn't have been more right and uh, for the last two days we've heard uh, we've heard history we've heard about historical wrongs we've also heard about historical rights in the sense uh, the rights of people and uh, where we are today we have discussed what exactly the big powers are looking at what the regional powers are looking at what uh, various participants in respective conflicts are looking at uh, we also have certain teasers which have been thrown in uh, just this morning when i was updating myself on the day's events i learned that president trump's son in law has mooted a peace plan which is going to be announced very shortly uh, of course this is a newspaper report which is yet to be uh, verified but it talks about a confederation between palestine and jordan now how much of veracity there is to this uh, how much of support it has either in palestine or in jordan or in the rest of the arab world in the rest of the muslim world how much support it has in israel itself uh, we don't know but it is a newspaper report as regards uh, the as our joint secretary uh, mr bhaskar spoke in the last session the chairman of the last session as he spoke about the request for india to be more actively involved there is another item in today's newspaper which says that our external affairs minister ms sushma swaraj is scheduled to visit syria as early as next week and this is uh, i think the first time our external affairs minister is visiting syria after 2011 that is after the conflict started building up and broke out so <coughs> it's easy to dismiss uh, these indicators as straws in the wind on the other hand in a region which is so bereft of hope any new idea which is thrown in i think is worthy of mention uh, we have a very distinguished panel here we have saudi arabia we have palestine we have lebanon we have india so it's balanced and uh, there are no presentations out here this uh, these are views since this is a panel discussion so i will start uh, we have three guests from foreign countries two to my right one to the left so i will request so uh, dr abad al badi to kindly give his views whatever he feels the way forward we've heard about various uh, uh, we've heard about various uh, solutions put forward about inclusive reg uh, inclusive regional cooperation about regional cooperation about mediation uh but 
essentially it's been about dialogue. So views of our panel on how to progress this dialogue will be welcome. Please. It is, uh, it is easier for me, uh, for the panel and for the audience, if you present a kind of a question, it would be easier on us because it's a panel discussion, not to choose my own or what the subject I want to talk about because there are many issues on the table. So I think this is make it easier to, to talk about issues. Very well. Uh, there is one question which has been on my mind when we were talking about uh, dialogue and we were talking about cooperation of regional powers. The question comes to my mind is that a lot of this conflict, of course, it is uh, within the Arab community, within the Muslim community as also without. So we have something about the role of big powers. We have uh, that saying, nature abhors a vacuum. In case someone withdraws from West Asia, what happens? Would the rest of the world be prepared to let West, uh, West Asia live by itself and come to solutions? So what exactly? Thank you. Uh, since uh, the Iranian-Saudi uh, rivalries was uh, a hot topic and was important one in all the presentation and the discussions, I remember I have written an article in Arabic and later uh, published as a chapter in English in Saudi-Iranian relations. And I ended the article by the title of your uh, thing, The Way Out or The Way Forward. So I thought in this article, why not to make use of historical experiences in managing dialogue between uh, rivalries, especially when one ideological and one supposed to be status quo, or one revisionist and one status quo country. So I thought of the experience of the East and the West and managing the relation between the Eastern Bloc, which a communist one, and the Western one that was supposed to be status quo, which the Helsinki Accord of 1974. And this accord was based on 10 principles. Yesterday, Ambassador uh, Mosatian, I think, mentioned it. And he thought it is uh, maybe a good way to start a dialogue in, in, in the Gulf to solve this issue. So in my article, I thought the main issue in this rivalry and the difficulty of reaching certain solution between the two countries, not only Saudi Arabia and Iran, the GCC and Iran. The issue for me was, because I was part of track two and uh, with the Iranian <coughs> meeting conferences and seminars, and always we come to the same issues. And as if we are just talking in a vicious circle about this issue. So I thought the mistrust is the real issue between these countries, al Faryushani country and the status quo country. And this mistrust based on two different narratives. Each country looks to the other from a certain angle. So they think of the Gulf are the Western powers puppet. They are organizing to destroy this Iranian revolution. The Gulf country thinking this is a revolution for export and it is to change the status quo. And as a monarchy, it is the real enemy that someone wants to, or a country want to change this situation. So I thought of making use of this experience that was based on 10 principles which is the principle of the UN Charter, the respective sovereignty, recognizing the existed order. It's almost 10, you know, referring to international legal code, uh, uh, resolving conflicts peacefully. And so I thought in my article, this is the way out to this kind of, of rivalry in between Iran and the Gulf or, or Saudi Arabia. So still, I think this is the way, but also, Iranian now talking about it. Saudis talking about it. The scholars and other intellectual in the area talking about this, this formula. Still not moving forward. This where I think India or 
China or Russia or the European Union to push toward this, to convince the parties to come to a certain understanding with the guarantee that Iran is, is a nation state. It's not a revolution. The other countries to respect w the Iranian revolution as long as it's Iranian. And it's not for the Islamic world or to change the status quo. So really, this is, I think, a very important step forward for what they call it, measure of, of what the, how to bring people to trust each other or to trust what the other is saying that they are genuine about looking at the other country's interests. So this is my take, at least in this uh, issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Avak. I have two more questions, but I will ask them after uh, I hear any views on what uh, our uh, panelists from Saudi Arabia have just spoken in case there are any views on what he said. In case there are any views on what he said. First of all, I would like to thank uh, IDSA for the invitation. This is my second time here, and I'm glad. Uh, to attend this uh, important event. Uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Uh, Awadi that we need the dialogue, especially in uh, the Arab world and the Muslim world, because we have a lack uh, of uh, dialogue. We have a lack of uh, tolerance and recognition the other. Uh, I, I, I believe most of our problems in the Arab world and the Muslim world, especially in the Middle East, uh, let's talk about uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, uh, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Bahrain, Yemen. It's that, uh, especially, I mean, the sectarian divide, uh, they don't recognize each other. If, if you have, for example, uh, in Iran, the majority is uh, Shia, we, 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 we always see that the Sunnis are complaining that they don't have their full rights, they are not equal, they are, uh, they are treated as like second uh, degree, they, are, they don't have the full rights that the Shia has, they have. If you go to Saudi Arabia, you will find the same issue, the, the Shia or the Ismaili or Zaidi, they say the same things, they feel they are not the, they don't have the full rights, they are treated as like second or third degree. So even in Iraq, when Saddam Hussein was uh, ruling the country, he was Sunni, he was treating the Shia as second or third degree, and he was like uh, oppressing them. You can find, say the same in Syria. So this is the problem. I mean, uh, we need, first of all, tolerance, uh, recognition of the other, and uh, justice and equality. If we can spread this principle in the Arab world and Muslim world and find out uh, the way to implement the human rights and the women rights and the minority rights so we can start to uh, solve this problem which led to the extremism. And if you, if you yesterday there was a lot of uh, discussion about uh, ISIS, uh, who created ISIS, and uh, was the Muslim Brotherhood, or was Qatar, was Turkey, was Saudi Arabia? Uh, I mean, it's a good discussion, but uh, first of all, there were many problems that created or that led to the rise of ISIS. One of them is the lack of tolerance. One of them is the uh, extremist uh, uh, thinking. For example, for the uh, Salafi schools, uh, we, we all know the Salafi school, which led to the Salafi Jihad school. It is a mix, mixture of the Salafi Wahhabi uh, doctrine with the political Islam. So this kind of ideology led to this kind of extremism. And also we cannot ignore the foreign intervention, for example, the, uh, in uh, Palestine, in Lebanon, the Israeli invasion in, uh, and occupation in in Iraq, the American invasion. So there are many factors uh, also played that, that role uh, that led to, the, uh, to our problems and, to the, to, and that led to reactions from some uh, local uh, parties 
Islamist or nationalist, yani we, we know in the 70s we, were, we had the PLO and some leftist uh, organization that uh, uh, operated many operations for, uh, against Israel, against some uh, uh, foreign uh, embassies or maybe they hijacked uh, planes, you know, because they, they, f f they wanted to uh, let the world hear or know about the Palestine, Palestinian cause. So that was uh, named and called terrorist, you know. But it was not uh, Islamist or uh, religious cause, it was national cause, you know. But they, they used the way what now, for example, Al-Qaeda or they are uh, using the same, uh, maybe m now more uh, violent and more uh, uh, extremist, but I mean, uh, yeah, you cannot just blame uh, religion or blame one uh, religion or one country for such extremism. Because in all religion, in all uh, countries, you can find uh, some kinds of extremism or uh, reasons that uh, lead to extremism. Thank you. Thank you, Udham. I'll just summarize uh, one point from there and some point from you. I think what uh, the last two speakers have panelists have generally said, one is the need for a principled dialogue. This is a dialogue between people who come uh, in front of each other and this is to be a principled dialogue, not between a victor and the vanquished, not between adversaries, it has to be in, a in an atmosphere of mutual respect. That is point one. The second very important thing which you brought out is that Sunnis and Shias feel discriminated wherever they are not in a majority, if I understand correctly. So this obviously then, uh, it brings about a certain sense of balance. Therefore, any country which is a Sunni majority vis-a-vis -vis any country which is Shia majority, seeing the overall good, obviously it is reasonable to come to an accommodation. What is again emphasized it that the basic problem is started from a lack of tolerance. And of course, tolerance is very short supply in the world these days. But the fact that we recognize it and that we are looking towards dialogue and we need recognize the need for tolerance is a positive sign. And the last point is, of course, equally important. There's no question of blaming a religion because uh, these are very, very human frailties. And when you do not recognize a human frailty but try to blame a religion for it, obviously, then you're not being very logical. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Minister Councillor, would you like? Is something or would you like to, you have a statement? Yes, good evening. Uh, so I prepared myself to speak about security and stability in one really. Uh, as I am a diplomat, really I couldn't see anything here, only I can to see that's we can talk till tomorrow, maybe three days about Iran, about Saudi, what they are so called conflict or crisis or misunderstanding. I agree fully with my colleague and my friend that we need reconciliation in the region. It is true. We need to build bridges of the trust between the both sides because we all of us in our poor experience that if there is a crisis it must to be a solution and to how to find the solution you make to organize and to manage a crisis management with references with conditions with timetable so I think that's the language, not only the most important as a diplomatic language, as arrogant language, the, I think the most important, it must to be the will and the, deter the determination from the both side, you know? And as my personal opinion, as not as an official, I am saying, I think that the both side, they are not international decision maker in the international policy. So as all of the 
experts lecture that they said here that they are manipulating by the international decision maker. You know, this is a problem. It, we must to think about our people, about our future, about the new generation. You know, that's the most important things. I think that the, this issue, it is very sensitive issue. And also, as I am a diplomat, I don't want to, to discuss or to, to make my analysis more deeply because I am representing my country and we have excellent relation with Saudi Arabia, you know, and we are part of the Arab region, you know. And also, in the same, we, we think very seriously that Iran, they must to change their, they are speaking something but they are some, sometimes practicing another things. But also they have the right also to be original, uh, to have a, a, a original role. And I am thinking that's what they had done between in the uh, agreement or the five plus one. I think that it was very important and it is, it was, and it has been the consensus of from the international community, except United States, who not not United States people, the Trump administration. He want to withdraw. So also Iran have the right, like the other countries. Is example Israel have the nuclear weapons. Why everybody not criticizing Israel? I am not speaking about now Saudi Arabia and, uh, and Iran. I am speaking in general. So I think that uh, I don't want, I prepared myself to speak about Palestine, about the instability and the uh, security in the region. And also I, I has uh, our uh, opinion as a Palestinian to say some things. If you give me the time, I will do. If there is no time, I, I, it is up to you. Thank you. We will just discuss these issues a little more. Uh, important uh, point which Minister Councillor brought out, he said that we can keep talking till the cows come home, but unless we do something concrete, and he spoke about a crisis management group. Uh, he also spoke about a point which I had thrown earlier at the audience, that uh, while it is all very well to talk about uh, bringing peace to the region, uh, what would the big powers feel about it? And this is the point which Minister has echoed. Uh, coming on to uh, Dr. Berry, would you like to say something on this, what has transpired so far? Uh, thank you, sir. When you, when you are the last speaker, mic goes on. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. When you are the last speaker, uh, the last day of the conference, is obviously the challenge for you is what new can you say, and uh, how can you hold the attention of your audience? So in that spirit, uh, since the topic uh, of this panel discussion is, uh, let me have a look, security and stability in Vana way forward, I thought I would bring in some new issues here for discussion before going on to take on uh, the chair's uh, uh, question about uh, uh, way forward. So uh, uh, since I must uh, f first of all make it very clear that I am an Africanist. So my, my points that I made today would be coming from my experience of studying Africa uh, for a very long time. And uh, I would like to make three points on the security situation in uh, North Africa in particular. Uh, uh, Surprisingly, we've been talking a lot about West Asia uh, in our conference. Uh, I was really happy to see that we did discuss North Africa too, and we had two speakers from North Africa, one in the form of my friend, dear friend, uh, Professor Badra Galul, and uh, Professor Ben Hamu uh, from Tunisia and Morocco, respectively. So my, uh, uh, the points that I'm gonna make here are first, that uh, the, uh, the conflict in West Asia has led to a, 
uh, has spilled over to North Africa in a big way. Second, uh, this conflict in West Asia has uh, blurred the lines between Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa and West Asia to some extent. And uh, so, um, I, so what is the North African security paradigm at the moment? Despite the collapse of the state of Syria and Iraq and the Libyan city of Sirte, terrorism threat continues in North Africa, and this is due to three factors. First, North Africa faces the risk of returning fighters who join the ranks of ISIS and Al-Qaeda in Syria and Iraq. Second, uh, and there are large numbers, uh, about 7,500 uh, uh, jihadists had joined the ranks uh, of uh, ISIS from North Africa particularly. Secondly, uh, some of the North African jihadists are relocating to Libya and uh, Egypt, uh, Egypt uh, Sinai Peninsula. So that creates problems for these host countries. Third, the threat uh, is, uh, lies in the continuing crisis in Libya where ISIS was driven out of Sirte, but it's re-emerging in central Libya uh, and on the western borders of Algeria and Tunisia. Fourth, the continuing threat for radicalization of youth in the African continent, in the um, uh, North African uh, region. S my second point is uh, regarding the uh, spread of terrorism because of the situation in North Africa to Sub-Saharan Africa. So you find that uh, while uh, the ISIS is uh, been uh, contained in Syria and in uh, Iraq, uh, there has been a reemergence of terrorism in Sahel and in uh, the Horn of Africa. And uh, uh, leading terror outfits such as Boko Haram are emerging in, uh, in the uh, Nigerian Nigeria in West Africa, uh, con uh, terror uh, outfits uh, such as uh, Jamaat, Nusrat, Al-Islam, uh, Wal Muslim, GNIM, which is an Al-Qaeda terror uh, affiliate, is emerging in Mali and, uh, uh, and also in Somalia, Al-Shabaab is going strong despite the attacks that have uh, been launched against it's uh, uh, you know against it by the UN, uh, the AU forces or the U.S. airstrikes. So what I'm trying to say here is that terrorism is spreading in in uh, these parts of world. And thirdly, what I would like to say is that uh, that there is an equal uh, uh, spill of the the sectarian conflict in West Asia, North Africa, uh, to the uh, Horn of Africa you find that uh, the countries in Horn of Africa have been forced to take sides, I mean, either with uh, Saudi Arabia or Iran in, in, in the conflict. And, and this is really leading to uh, a scramble for uh, bases or facilities in this part of the world, increasing tensions in, in uh, Horn of Africa. So you, f you find that, uh, say for example, in Djibouti, which already hosted uh, bases from US, uh, from uh, uh, China, uh, France, Italy, uh, ha and uh, till uh, very recently UAE is uh, the foremost uh, in terms of uh, this new development. Uh, similarly, Sudan is reportedly agreed to uh, uh, with Turkey to establish a base uh, in in, in, in its uh, Red Sea region. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, there are, uh, UAE has gone in a big way and uh, oh, had a dialogue with uh, the autonomous regions in Somalia uh, for uh, developing ports in uh, uh, Barbera and Bosaso, which are in the autonomous region of Somaliland and Puntland in, uh, in Somalia. And finally, Turkey is establishing uh, a base in Mogadishu in, uh, in Somalia. So, so you find that there is an increasing scramble for uh, bases and port facilities in, 
in Horn of Africa. Uh, and this is obviously the result of the war against Houthis in, in Yemen, which the Saudi Arabia and uh, the other coalition has, has, has launched. So, uh, so, so, so apart from giving these, this bad news, there is a good news that is emerging for the region, is that this continued interaction or engagement by some of the uh, regional powers has done some good in the region too. And here I'm talking about the ending of conflict between Eritrea and uh, Ethiopia. That has ended basically because of the efforts of U UAE uh, in engaging with both Asmara and Addis Ababa. So, 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 uh, so you find that there is a good news and there is a bad news which is coming out of uh, the West Asia North Africa region and the Sub-Saharan Africa region. So what is the way forward? How do you deal with these issues? I agree with the, the chair when he says that dialogue is the way out. So obviously, uh, the two uh, regional giants, whether it is Iran or Saudi Arabia, need to settle their bilateral regional sectarian conflict through a, a, a dialogue. And this dialogue uh, uh, is essential because of the trust deficit between the two parties. And uh, they may follow a two-pronged approach. First would be a bilat at a bilateral political level, where uh, both countries may discuss the fight against terrorism, the future scenarios in the various uh, regional hotspots, whether it's Syria, Iraq, or Yemen. Uh, and second, uh, they, they should talk about reconstruction and infrastructure development uh, in, in the region. Uh, because as you're aware, the, civil, the, the recurring conflict in the region has almost destroyed the uh, infrastructure in Yemen, Syria, and Iraq, and Libya. So, so rehabilitation process in the conflict zones should be given a priority by these, these countries. Th at the third level, I think uh, uh, globally, major powers and uh, regional powers, including India, should make efforts uh, for pushing for a negotiated settlement for peace and stability in uh, West Asia and North Africa. I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Essentially, what you said is that terrorism, which has spilled over into Africa uh, from West Asia and come down from the Maghreb to the Sub-Saharan region, is resulting in nations bolstering up the security by opening more and more ports and opening bases. So. To that extent, you're saying that there has been some cooperation between nations in that sphere. And essentially what you're saying is that there has been some good news. One war has ended. And uh, the way forward is, again, regional cooperation with uh, globally some sort of a negotiated settlement coming in. Uh, unexceptionable. Uh, I'll throw a question at the panel. Nine, uh, just one question which I'll request uh, you to consider which might uh, might help. Uh, in 1972, Henry Kissinger went to China. From the time China became communist till 1971, 1970, China was almost untouchable by the West. The one visit of Henry Kissinger in 1972 changed all that. It changed global dynamics, it changed global geopolitics, it changed the economy of the earth, and today we know where we are in terms of the United States and China. So my, uh, the point I'm throwing at the panel is that West Asia, North Africa, these particular countries which you are seeing afflicted by war, uh, terrorism is a byproduct, but essentially it is, uh, I mean, we should not, uh, the, the causes of conflict are not terrorism. The causes of conflict are deeper. Now the history has moved on. Terrorism is another way of expressing uh, discontent, a wrong way, but it is there, which we acknowledge. Is it time now for why I gave the example of Henry Kissinger of 1972? Is it time now for a grand gesture? At times, gestures convey a lot. They may be short on substance, but the gesture by itself is very meaningful. And thereafter, how to progress it is a matter for the for the staff, so as you say, in the military. But is it time for a grand gesture? Today, for example, I throw it to the panel. If it is decided, 
say Saudi Arabia or Iran, if they say, all right, without preconditions, we are holding a conference and we invite all affected parties to be present. And we do not invite powers from outside the region. Is that a grand gesture and will it help? Views, please. Views. I mean, this is so, I'm just asking for your views. Yes. First, we have to recognize the fact there is no great leaders anymore. There is no leader with a vision to present to the region, even to the whole world. As I said yesterday, the whole world in confusion. No country is providing this grand leadership to provide a real vision toward a peaceful world. We are in the situation now that the world order that existed for 70 years and was peaceful to some extent and helped the world to, to advance in too many fields, not only politics or military or whatever, no, a human thing. So this is now in trouble. So all countries is not providing, for example, China is rising and they maybe they have their own thinking for the new world order, but it is not there. They are not in the position to provide the world with something. So this is reflected in our region. The region is byproduct of this great power's design. The whole state border to some extent is, uh, is drawn by these powers. So I think we are in a situation, even if Saudi Arabia or Iran comes with this kind of initiative, still it, did, it would not solve the issue. For example, Iran is a regional power, nobody denies that. It's by nature important country, major country in the region, nobody denying that. People is arguing and is in differences with Iran regarding its role, the nature of the role. Maybe the same thing with Saudi Arabia or with the other. So the other issue, whenever there is a leader who rises, wants to get this region together, the whole world aligned against him. And for example, today somebody asked about a great idea that gets the Arab or the Muslim together. For example, the Arab, they came with the idea of Arabism. And they were great leaders trying to unite the whole region. The whole world turned against that idea. And when some come with the Islamic idea, the whole world would come with it. Is it good or bad with terrorism or without terrorism? There is no space to allow a visionary leader who wants to provide the region or get the region out of its problem. So I think this is the real issue. It comes to the other point, the role of great powers or the asp aspiring great powers. How to play a role in convincing the other, how to come together to dialogue and based on a certain principle that preserve the interest of all the parties. And this is, I think, very important. We need that middleman sometimes is out of the region. And I'm not calling for that, but the experience shows without a foreign important influence to influence the parties, it is difficult. The second point regarding Saudi Arabia, there is no problem to get together. They had diplomatic relations until 2016. And this leads me to the word that our colleague he thought the conflict is Shia Sunnah. It is never Shia Sunnah. And we should not reduce the conflict to this at all. Iran was Shia at always. We had good relation when the Shah was there. From the 90s to 2016, we had good relation with Iran. But that's, I think, the issue. If we reduce the situation, and unfortunate to find Indian scholars is uh, victims of the Western understanding of the conflict at our region. When they analyze it, they analyze it as Shia, Sunnah. This is Saudi representing this Iran. This is a big mistake. And Indian scholarship should not fall victim in this trap. To understand the situation, it is geopolitics. It is state to state, the uh, conflicting interest of a state. 
different vision of, of the region. I think this is the real issue. Do we expect a new leader coming? I doubt. So we are in this confused things. Let's wish and hope that someone, some country arise to, to the big responsibility to provide a kind of vision to get countries together. I'm sorry to take the time and thank you. Yes, please. I would uh, like to say some things here and also uh, due to the short time, I shall try to shorten my presentation and to speak at the three points regarding the security and the stability in WANA in general. Uh, through a long time of the history, the strategic region has gone through crises, wars, because the conflicts between the old and the new colonial powers. To control this vital region for its important geographical location, sea roads, many natural resources. I don't want to speak about details, but let's to speak about the last 10 years. The Middle East for one start, I would say in 2011, Middle East has been struck by a hard summer storm. Countries were destroyed, civil wars were dominating the sense, and sadly, millions of the people were victims from their homes hundreds of, of thousands got killed and strongly, strongly really I am saying it is enough and worse. We must to concentrate how to bring it to an end and how to pacify, to stabilize, to bring peace. I think there are at least four points one has to touch upon in order to bring to peer the direction of the events. First, we must do things, and I think is how to defend the national and the national states. That has been disappearing <coughs> or being destroyed. It is very important. And I don't want to say here and to mention about which country name. I think that's also to speak about the concepts. There is a problem in the region, not only the war and the civil war. There is a poverty. There is a social how to say, uh, social decline. We must to find the solution. We must to, to find the slogans and dialogues based in the international principle of United Nations. We have uh, principles. Why we must to, to look for with the new concepts or new principle. We have uh, principles and values. And I think that we must to, to think very seriously. Also, there is a prevent diplomacy. Nobody here in this conference spoke about the prevent diplomacy. Why to it? Why to it the confrontation? Why not to, to use the, the, the language of the diplomacy, the kind of the diplomacy which it is called prevent diplomacy? That's to prevent resurgence of the terrorism and deal effectively with the security threats. It is very important. And also, as I don't want to repeat my colleague what he said, but I will tell in different language, that let's to unite against violence in the name of the religion. It is very important. It is, it is very important not only in, in one region, but in the whole world. We are facing in Palestine serious problem. Now, shortly, we will have apartheid regime, modern and apartheid regime. You know, 
made by Israel backing mail by the United States. It is very important. Let's, let's to enhance the mutual respect and for the sovereignty. Ter territorial integrity, uh, in, in, uh, territory integrity, mutual non-aggression, and non-interference in each other, internal affairs, equality and mutual benefit. And lastly, list to enhance the peaceful coexistence between the people. We must to concentrate on, on the relationship between people to people. More to give the importance, not only for between the states or between government to government, between parties, list to strengthen and to enhance the people, people relationship. There is another factor which it is the most important factor in the in in the region, and we think that the most important factor is, uh, in the region in instability and insecurity is not ending the Israeli occupation and not to give the Palestinian people their right and self determination and the establishment of the independent state with Jerusalem as its capital according to the United Nations resolution. The conflict of the Middle East has been raging for 70 years. It started in Palestine and expanded to include the whole Middle East. The, the region will not live in peace and security as long as the issue of Palestine is properly and justly solved. It is the mother of the grievances in the Middle East. It will be also the mother of the comprehensive, durable, and a just peace in the interior, the entire region. And let's to speak about Palestine a little bit. And I would like to thank all scholar, all people those spoke about Palestine and they expressed their solidarity with the Palestinian people. But I want to mention that in 1947, the United Nations resolution was endorsed by the General Assembly calling for the creation of two states. One, the land of historical Palestine. One Israeli, Israeli state and one for the Palestinian people. Promises made, but promises broken. One state created is Israel, and the other denied Palestine. One side of the history full triumph and glory, and the other filled with the stories of discussions and occupation and the struggle for the basic of human rights. Now, the problem in the region, and it is very clear now, that Israel, the occupying power, still believes and considers itself above the international accountability. It is the main reason. And it couldn't, we couldn't have stability and peace in the region if one country it is above of the international law. It is, it, is, it is unacceptable, not for Palestinians, but for the other nations. St uh, Israel is still violating the international law and the international humanitarian in the occupied Palestinian land against our people. Only give me two minutes, and I will finalize. I have 10 papers, but I will try my best. I am uh, telling now I want to give you only example. Just yesterday happened. I don't want to go by details to speak about the settlements, about our prisoners, about our uh, they are the checkpoints, you know, they controlling our life 
economically and all kind the all natural single moments in Palestine it is controlling by Israel and if we will give them time they will control the air you know so yesterday what happened the Israeli high court grave the military the green light to demolish Khan al Ahmar village it was yesterday now the law of the Israel it is part of the occupation The, the green light to demolish Khan al, uh, al Ahmar village within one week and displace the Palestinian residents. Destroying the village of Khan al Ahmar located in East Jerusalem is planted ethnic cleansing. I am telling you only the last uh, minute Israel is using the failure of the international community, especially Europa and Europe and the United States to impose a solution to act with alter and terrifying impunity to impose solution of its own making. The current Israeli government, and it is clear now for everybody, is an extremely hard-lined right-wing racist government. Israel uses the language of ideology, the hyper-nationalism, and religious absolution. Israel tries to first relation with other countries, relying on such ideological approaches. So what we can say, it, it is how to say to you that uh, I don't want to repeat that the importance to have a solution for the Palestinian issue, to have a security and the peace. And also, I don't, <laughs> because there is no time I wanted to speak about the ultimate deal, which we don't know what it is ultimate deal, but we know that's from the Trump administration that Jerusalem refugees issue, uh, it is out of the negotiation table. But we confirm here to everybody, if Jerusalem and the refugees issue out of the table, we tell also, the peace will be out of the table. I will finalize with this sentence. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Minister Councillor. Uh, uh, just a point before I, uh, what uh, Tawad was saying. Uh, you spoke about uh, India thinking that uh, it's a Shia Sunni conflict. No, uh, India doesn't think that way. As far as West Asia is concerned, the point I'm trying to make here is that West Asia is a region and the problems in this region have arisen to a great extent historical and to a great extent created because of divisions of community, sect and race. Because it is not an Arab region in full. There are so many other communities, there are so many other sects. Therefore, the point was that if we have decided that reconciliation is the way forward, then an understanding that everyone has to be represented. And it, it has to be inclusive. The word inclusive becomes very important. So how that is to be organized is something firstly has to be done from within, uh, the way I see it. And if it has to be done from within, then the drivers have got to be from within. And the drivers are the larger nations which have to take the smaller nations of the region on board to the exclusion of anyone from outside. So that is what I was trying to put across. As and, and just, was, uh, uh, just one second, which is uh, what I talked about Indian scholarship that I wish they are not to be victim of, of this kind of analysis, not uh, Indian policy. Okay. Uh, as regards what the Minister Councillor said, uh, the principles on which he was talking about uh, dialogue, preventing social decline on humanitarian grounds, te maintaining territorial uh, integrity, equality, coexistence, all very valid. Uh, we coming back to the same question that while we understand that we have got to talk, there have been wrongs, there have been rights if we have to talk. So the aim of the exercise is how do we go about doing it? Which is why I was trying to throw the idea of a big, a grand gesture. Anything? Uh, first, I, I want to correct my colleague. I did not say it's a Shia Sunni conflict. I was talking about uh, the lack of tolerance and uh, justice and equality in the Arab and Muslim country 
Uh, and I gave example that where is the country is dominated by Sunni ruler, they uh, discriminate the Shia and uh, vice versa. Uh, but if you go back to the Saudi the discourse, you know, uh, are, are for 10 years or more, you know, uh, they are talking about the Shia crescent, yeah, you know, which extends from Iran to Beirut. This is not my my discourse. This is your propaganda, your discourse. I mean, if it was, it is. There is no Shia crescent. This is only geopolitics. Why are you using these words? And this uh, sectarian uh, discourse uh, also yeah, uh, helps to spread the sectarian in the Arab and Muslim world. Uh, I I suggest. I mean, Iran is a neighbor country. is a Muslim country, and you don't have problem with Iran during Shah, as you said. This is good. Uh, so uh, Palestine is the main uh, cause for Arabs and Muslims. And it can be the cause to approach, uh, and make a rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the Arab uh, countries. Why you are getting closer to Israel, and uh, you are like, uh, adopting the Israeli discourse against Iran and against the nuclear uh, Iranian program, uh, which was uh, yani signed by uh, six uh, great powers with, with Iran. Uh, and the only states in the world who oppose this is Israel and Saudi Arabia. So uh, I mean, this is the problem. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Kissinger and uh, its uh, initiative towards China, which uh, yani make alliance with China against the Soviet Union, which changed the geopolitics in the world. Uh, I, th I think Obama was trying to do the same by signing the nuclear war with Iran and was hoping it will change the Middle East and the relation with Iran. Uh, I mean, he, he didn't get more time to do more, and maybe the Iranians, they were not ready to more relations or more uh, good step with uh, America. But uh, the problem, I mean, when, when you sign a, contra a deal and another pre American president comes and cancels the deal, you know, and uh, raise the tension with Iran, so uh, how, c how can you expect from Iran to change from a revolutionary uh, status or discourse to a state, I, I'm criticizing Iran because it's like for four decades, it's still talking that they are a revolution. You know, they are, they need to become a state, a stable state, and stop their intervention in other country. And I don't agree with the Iran intervention in some Arab country, but also we see the Saudi Arabia intervening in the other countries. So. And when you accuse Iran, you have to also don't uh, behave the same behavior of Iran. Thank you. Right. We have five minutes left. I'm going to take my privilege of asking comments from two people. And I've seen a third hand raised, so finally three people. So the first person I'm going to ask is Professor Mustafa. The yeah, okay. Uh, just fine. Well, um, uh, in terms of grand gestures, obviously this would be a welcome gesture towards, uh, uh, which would end uh, uh, years of conflict in the region. But then, uh, as has been said, each, uh, first it should involve each and every stakeholder in the region. It should not be uh, uh, limited to a few actors in, in uh, in the regional security paradigm. And uh, secondly, I think it, it should also uh, cover the fact that, uh, that security in the region is not limited just to, uh, uh, you know, partisan views about uh, how uh, uh, some countries view, uh, their, have their own perception about the way the shape of the region should be. Uh, from an in Indian viewpoint, uh, uh, India has a vital stake in security and stability of West Asian region. And for India, security does not 
just means end of conflict it also means uh, uh, to become an uh, to be to to have a situation which is an enabler for fulfilling the desires of the people which is people centric which which leads to uh, human uh, security which leads to economic development in in the region so security and economic development go hand in hand in terms of india's uh, vision of uh, uh, ending any conflict in, in the region so in that context i would say that uh, a perfect solution to the conflict in uh, west asia would not be possible until unless all stakeholders and in, are involved including the wishes of the people in the region point well made uh, dr mustafa uh, mr jain and finally ending with ambassador sajadpur yes. um thank you i think it's quite late <laughs> in the day to make new suggestions and uh, maybe provocative ideas uh, but let me say a few things um, first of all the problems of the region are multifronted uh, the urgency of security issues uh, usually uh, hides that reality. Uh, in this meeting also, we've been talking all the current and recent security issues and uh, actually ignoring, in a sense, or at least forgetting uh, for some time uh, that the region has other problems. And uh, actually, there are many. And most of these problems, you know, economic, social, uh, cultural problems, are actually uh, the root causes of uh, current security problems. So in order to deal with the security problems, actually we have to deal with economical, political, and social problems uh, of the region. Um, these are the underlying realities. We have to look into them. Um, secondly, um, regional problems uh, that uh, in the Middle East have uh, had originally emerged uh, with the involvement of various international actors. And almost none of the security issues, I'm talking the security issues, not political, social, and economic, but none of the security issues of the region uh, could be talked without uh, referring to outsiders. Uh, that's a part of the problem, actually. Uh, in interference of outsiders since the late 19th century, actually. It's not a new phenomenon. So. Uh, how to deal with it, it's a, it's a big problematic there. Uh, it's easy to say that uh, outsiders should leave the regional countries to talk among themselves. It's easy to say that, but in reality, that's almost impossible. We know the reasons why it's impossible. So we have to find a way to work around that uh, impediment of, uh, of solution. Uh, thirdly, unfortunately, many of the problems, almost I would say the, all the problems that we are uh, talking about in the region today were identified at the end of the Cold War and discussed extensively by the experts and academics and also the policymakers in various countries. And there were recommendations, actually, uh, to prevent something uh, similar uh, to Arab Spring emerging. Um, I was presented, uh, I was uh, attend, I attended a number of meetings uh, such meetings in early 1990s uh, that discussed the problems of the uh, region and offered solutions and, and, uh, and possible ways of uh, alleviating those problems, uh, but nothing has done. And we, uh, we, f we are now facing the problems of so-called uh, Arab Spring. So it's, it's, it's not the failure of talks and it's not the failure of academics and experts to come out uh, with ideas. It's the failure of foremost the regional uh, and secondly the global leaders, political leaders, to implement those, uh, those policies and ideas. Um, the region as a whole, when you look at it, is lacking behind uh, from, uh, from the world in general, uh, from many aspects. If you look at from economic aspects, human development aspects, uh, and from uh, social aspects, various aspects, human rights, uh, rule of law, and everything. So this is the root, pro root of the problem. We, as a regional countries and the people living in this region, we have to address these problems ourselves. 
we cannot expect outsiders to come and address this problem. So it's, it's always easy to blame the others. Uh, we can keep continue blaming United States, Russia, China, India, and you know, Israel or uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Turkey for our own problems and grievances, but the root of the problem is that we have to address these problems and, and solve them. Um, when you look at it um, in the region, um, first of all, what, what we have to do is actually start looking inside the countries. And every country should start looking their inside uh, with an intention of reforming and enhancing uh, the quality of life for their own citizens. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, many countries are not doing that. I mean, you know, everybody would think that it's the, it's the life reason of the politicians and the rulers to do that, but it's not happening in the Middle East, actually. Uh, when you got together with the regional uh, experts and start talking uh, unofficially, you get uh, understanding that in none of, almost none of the countries, and there are of course exceptions, that leaders are not doing that. Um, so that's the first step. We have to start uh, from, from the insi uh, inside of the state, implementing more inclusionary policies uh, of, of the citizens, regional countries, their own citizens. They have to involve in their policies and in, in, uh, in problem solving. This would solve one of the biggest problems of the regional countries, which is the legitimacy of rulers. In many countries, this is also a, a quite a big underlying problem, a legitimacy of the ruling classes, rulers, and etc. Once that, uh, that is weakened, then all the other problems start to emerge immediately. Fun finally, we have to continue to engage with other countries. You know, it's, uh, everybody is right on their, in, in their own countries. As a Turk, I would say Turkey is always right. Uh, personally, I never say that, uh, actually. But uh, I, I, I am minority in this region, uh, maybe in the world also. Uh, but many people would prioritize their own countries, and they would say that they are always right. But uh, the only way to, to make a peace is to talk your enemies. You know, the, the peace is only can be made with the enemies, not with your friends. With your friends, you are friends. So with your enemies, you have to sit down and talk, whether you like it or not, and, and continue to talking it. Uh, the outsiders, the friendly outsiders, I would say, uh, like India, maybe, uh, if they are uh, interested to alleviate some of the problems of, the, of this region, they should just facilitate that dialogue. Not intervene, not maybe sh even show the way, but just facilitate that dialogue uh, and uh, eventually something might come out of it. Uh, one of the problems of the region is the is lack of dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Mustafa, for giving us that detailed viewpoint. And from an insider, it is important. And essentially, you are echoing what uh, we're trying to formulate, that you have to talk and look within set governance right and talk to each other. And excluding big powers, how difficult it is, is understandable considering the hold they've had all these years. And to try and remove a superpower from that region uh, is not going to be easy. As regards talking to neighbors with whom you have problems, I was just talking to uh, Dr. Jin uh, this morning. And we were talking about India and China. We almost came to war. But then we didn't come to war. We almost came to war. We didn't come to war. We understand we don't have to go to war. We should not go to war. And uh, I think uh, it's a very mature step that we took. And uh, this is something which uh, has to be done in case the nation has to move forward. Please, comment. Actually, my point arguments are very similar. I will try, try to be very brief, please, uh, another way. I think, I think Saudi Arabia, Iran, we are both friends. We are friendly outsiders. But uh, uh, you are neighbors that we are not move away. You have to talk, otherwise you will have to fight. China is, uh, I, I would like to say, one of the best countries in dealing with this kind of issues. Yeah, I, I don't think that Saudi-Iran rela relations uh, problem is more uh, more than China-Japan relations. We we fought uh, many years of war, very very bloody. But finally, we, we, we came to talk, we came to talk. And in this, I would like to say, 
we, we have to change the kind of discourse. We, we, we should not just always talk about geopolitical competition. We have to talk about cooperation. P please, if you check with the Chinese, the, the website of the Chinese Foreign Ministry, you, 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 you see that the statements, we would always say we are seeking cooperation. Co cooperation. So uh, that is the discourse. And also, by seeking cooperation, I also mean that we have to seek common grants. Seek, seek shared interests. I think Middle East countries, what is the biggest interest? The biggest interest is security, stability. I think that is uh, the idea. So the way we, we, we have to change the, the kind of, uh, actually, to be very honest, to be very honest, 10 years ago, when I was still a student, I, ho I had a lot of, <laughs> a lot of uh, <laughs> such kind of, uh, uh, discussions between Iranians and, uh, and the Saudis, a lot of uh, exchange of, yeah. But we, 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 can we just uh, stop complaining against each other? Let, let's, let's start our discussion like this. We should cooperate in this way. We should cooperate in this way, though we have problems. Okay, I will just uh, stop here. Thank you. Ambassador Sugar. Yeah, <laughs> actually, <laughs> <laughs> since uh, let me come there. Uh, actually, I want to start by a joke about the final speech. You know, after invasion of Iraq, since we are all following West Asia or Middle East. Uh, a group of regional uh, scholars, social scientists, decide to go to Iraq and to a do a field research. What has been the impact of invasion on uh, fabric of Iraqi society? And they are arrested by American forces. And since it's time of war, war zone, so you are arrested. And they, these are arrested. And they say you are sentenced to death. One is an Arab scholar, the other one is, are you? Recording, no, it's not recording. And uh, Arab scholar, the other one is uh, an Iranian one, the other one is uh, an Afghan scholar. And they asked them, what's your final wish? The Arab scholar says, give me just a glass of water, then hang me. The Iranian one says, I want to have my final speech. <laughs> and the Afghan scholar says, kill me before he gives his final speech. <laughs> So I think actually uh, I don't want to go to what our colleagues uh, discuss. Dr. Mina told me the way forward, how we can think of the future. And since we are all from think tanks and policy centers, actually I came again to this question, what shall we do? Mostly focusing on our own rather than, let's say, the states or, or the others. I think, first of all, Again, ABC. Analysis is a key, the key element in our job. And a good analysis is a rare commodity these days. Because fast food analysis is everywhere. Headline analysis. And I think this region is more complicated than just having a quick analysis and solution for everything. And I think we have to avoid uh, fast food analysis. We have to avoid nar dominant narratives. I think this Shi Sony narrative is a wrong one. It's just fabricated for, uh, let's say, political purposes. It's not analysis. It's a policy. It's a type of follow-up. And I think we need to change our cognitive map. And a cognitive map is where we look at the issues from a pre-assumed perspective. And I think this is uh, one of the fallacies of a good analysis. B, I think, yes, we have to have good analysis, but uh, still we are, we should be activists and we have to build bridges. Bridge is, I think, a concept that we have to work. Bridge between uh, 
different bonds which exist in this region. This region is not only about war. It's also about bonds between people, between communities. We can communicate easily with all of them. I mean, as an Iranian, I have no problem with any uh, uh, Turk, any Arab, any, uh, let's say, any, uh, anyone in the region, because we have so many bonds. We have to bridge upon this and with Indians and the others. And I think here, bilaterals are very important because they are bridge builders, but multilaterals are also very important, bilateral and multilateral. Finally, I think on my C is uh, a conflict uh, management techniques should be more applied. We cannot solve some of these conflicts, they are very tough, but at least we can freeze tensions. So let's think of freezing tensions and avoid zero-sum games and try to be more uh, positive on not letting the issues become worse. And I think this is, at least it is a minimal that we can expect. And I think regardless of all challenges, we, re we have to remain hopeful. Uh, and all wars should end and end. And I think with this uh, aspiration and hope, I think we have to have an analysis for the looking for making bridges and with this hope that finally we can contribute to peace and security. Uh, so I, I actually, uh, I think we have also as analysts, we have to have dreams. And our dream is where our analysis be used huh? as a base, but we, should, we have to be hopeful when we have uh, our analysis and our solution and uh, the dream of uh, uh, having no conflict as still should remain always with us. Uh, so I think my five minutes finished, but I have two other lectures. One is long one and the other one is short one. The long one is, thank you very much, IDSA and Dr. Termin on the team, and the short one is thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Ambassador, and uh, thank you for the words of wisdom, and the, especially the last one, remain hopeful. Uh, uh, this brings me to the end of our final discussion. We are slightly over time. Uh, I wish to thank our panelists for putting across their views on the thing, and may I request you to give them a big. <laughs>